Hi, everyone, and welcome to the perhaps most anticipated panel of the day, the CEO Roulette. My name is Lassen Mertzog, CEO for Presenter Group. Last year's panel was all about getting up close and personal with the CEOs. This time around, I'm going to continue to ask pertinent and sometimes difficult questions. And the CEOs I have with me today, they won't be playing roulette, but they will move around slightly on stage to indicate their replies to statements I make. Do they agree or do they disagree? But before I go into the details of how it works, I would like to introduce our panelists on stage. First up, we have Hilary Stewart-Jones, Skywind Group. We have Alexander Stevendal, Video Slots. David Flynn, Glitnor Group. Jesper Svensson, Betson Group. Sashi Maimon, Aspire Global and Neo Games. I think most of you know them and that they do not require much of an introduction. But nevertheless, I'm going to let them say a few words about themselves before we get started. Would you like to start, Hilary? Hi, everyone. My name is Hilary Stewart-Jones. I'm currently the CEO and Chairman of Skywind Group Holdings, which is a content provider company and also CEO of InTouch Games, a business that we bought um, earlier this year, in fact, which is a B2C provider. My background is a lawyer, so I'm slightly unusual amongst this company because it's not normally that you end up in an executive position, but I'm very privileged to be here, and thank you. Thank you. Alexander? Hello, everyone. I'm Alexander, CEO of Video Slots and founder. Um, been in the industry for... 16 years, I think, 17 maybe, uh, started off as a poker player and then became an affiliate and then a poker company and now a casino. Hi everybody, my name is David Flynn, CEO of Glitnor Group. I've uh, been in the industry just shy of 20 years now. It uh, doesn't feel like it at all. Um, been uh, uh, managing the business for the last three years. We focus across B2C, B2B and affiliation. Hi, I am, <coughs> I'm Jesper Svensson. I've also been in the industry for 15 or 20 years, somewhere in between there at least, and the last 10 almost in Betson, where I'm the operational CEO and uh, working out from Malta here. Hi, I'm Tzachi Maimon. Um, I'm in the industry for the last 14, 15 years. Started in Playtech, and then for the last uh, 10 years in Aspire, being the CEO of Aspire and recently uh, were acquired by NeoGames, so acting also as the president of the group. Thank you. We only have 35 minutes today and I have a lot of questions that I want to ask the panelists, so let's get started. The rules here are simple. I have five chairs to my right and five chairs to my left. I will make statements and the panelists must choose a side. Do they agree or do they disagree? Then after they have chosen a side, I will, of course, dig a bit deeper with follow-up questions. And there are no chairs in the middle, so there are no maybes allowed, and this will hopefully trigger some interesting discussions. But let's kick it off with the first statement of the day. I can read it. The current economic climate will affect our financial performance negatively in 2022. Panelists, what do you say? Choose a side. Do you agree or do you disagree? <laughs> ah, that was an easy one. <laughs> David, why don't you go first? Why, why did you choose this side? Um, I, was, I was very close to moving over to that side, actually. But uh, uh, ultimately, the, there will be some challenges, of course. Uh, you know, with um, the price of heating going up, uh, people's pockets being smaller, uh, inflation rates, uh, mortgages, etc. We anticipate that uh, there will be some challenges uh, coming in certain markets. I think it really all depends how each individual company manages those challenges, though. So in a way, whilst you're looking at individual figures, perhaps, hmm. in some markets you may have challenges, or maybe you're expanding elsewhere, could be doing other things. So overall, it could look really great. But uh, yeah, there'll be differences dependent on different markets, I think. 
Thank you. Jesper, why do you say, or uh, Sashi even put up his hand. Yeah, yeah, just quickly, I think um, we will be less affected than most uh, because the, the industry has proven to be going in good times and in bad times. Um, but the question is, somewhat affected. Mm. We will grow, the industry will grow, but uh, I think it would have grown even more in different circumstances in that sense though. But it's a fantastic industry that tends to grow both in hard times and in um, good times, so to say. That's true. What do you say, Sashi? I think, uh, I think the only one uh, talking from the B2B perspective, I think that uh, it will be challenging for operators especially startups, uh, but some that want to have um, access to money, mm. and now the access to money is a little bit more expensive. Their investment will be more where the immediate ROI will be. So I think that uh, if in the previous years, operators would have been able to invest a lot in marketing, it will be a little bit uh, less, and it will affect also the suppliers behind the scenes uh, because of that. Yeah. yeah. Hilary, you also chose the agree side. Have you in any way changed your strategy for, to counter for the current climate, perhaps more focus on short-term revenues rather than building long-term company value? Yes, I mean, it's interesting, but I agree with all the points that have been made. But, you know, we suffered severe impact by virtue of having offices in the Ukraine. Um, you know, heartbreaking, really, to deal with huge numbers of staff trying to leave, you know, your colleagues being, you know, conscripted. So that, that's been a tough element, but the, the going to the actual sort of micro, um, macroeconomics, yes, we will have an impact in our business. The other thing that I wanted to mention as well is that we've had to try and think smartly about our strategy around staff because there's huge levels of dissatisfaction among staff where they obviously the cost of living, living has gone up tremendously. They are dissatisfied, and I know that we're going to be talking about this a little bit later on, but getting people back into a, a regular working lifestyle after COVID has proved very challenging as well, mm. with people wanting to, to work from home. And that can work as a strategy too, because it does mean that you can reduce office space. There are a lot of moving parts to all of this, so we focus very much on trying to retain staff and keep staff happy, uh, which is, you know, even though the rest of the world is going to hell, we're hoping that we can keep our staff on board with us at this time. Good thinking. Alexander, do you think our industry is recession-proof? It's a statement that I hear quite often, and now it's perhaps going to be tested for real. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it's going to be quite challenging in, in, in local markets. Uh, our strategy is to, to expand in new markets to cover up the, the losses on, on the markets we're already quite large on. Makes sense. Let's go to the next statement, shall we? In a male-dominated industry like ours, it's harder to be a woman and a leader. Panelists, I'm please off. choose your side. Yes. Agree or of disagree? In the... Can Very I... interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you have to read the question again. Let's start with you, Hillary, while they make up their mind. Well, why, did you choose the, why did you choose the disagree side? The demographics of the panel, the, you know, the sort of like the way the industry has approached uh, women as a way of, of, of selling product, really, rather than, you know, empowering them. It's, it's different now, and things have changed massively in the 20 plus years I've been involved. But there are still very, very few women on gaming boards, mm. which is a shame, really. I mean, they, obviously, you, you, you get a, a proportional representation across most um, other companies in the UK and a positive discrimination, but I, I have yet to see that filter through at a board level in gaming companies. Yeah. Alex, why did you choose the... I, I don't realize which side that sits, sat down on. <laughs> you're you're <laughs> disagreeing to the statement that it's harder to be a woman and a leader. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, well, I, I do think that uh, women have a lot of uh, potential in the industry. Uh, I mean, it's a male-dominant one, but if you look at the biggest leaders, they are uh, women. We can see Battery 6 five. Yes. Uh, very strong leader. That's probably the strongest leader. Uh, but... But it is getting better, isn't it? It, it is getting better. Uh, I mean, in our company, we have a lot of uh, women who, who is leaders. And, and mm -hmm. I really believe that it's male-dominant just because there are more gamblers among men who, mm. who has this an interest. Interesting. I, can I add to that? Add to that. I think that the whole 
key point in many areas. I think we are 40 percent female in, in Betson, for example, yeah. which is quite a high percentage. But when you look into some of the fields that we actually do have staffing, for example, big technology teams and so forth, and, and there I find us to be very proportional to actually what the talent is out there, because in engineering, I believe nowadays 70 or 75 percent of people who go out from engineering degrees are male, you know, so by default, then if we think that the, in an equal world that the competence is the same, then our product development should be 75-25 if, if you look at that. So, so I think this industry is a relatively young industry in many ways, it's a digital industry, and I think we we are quite good in many ways to to not be old school type yeah. of bookmaker in the corner that is very male driven in that sense though so exactly and even you know going to we were talking about events organization even those have become a lot more ethical mm. and we were talking outside about you know polegate when the ceo of the gambling commission turned up at um, ice and there was pole dancing and, you know, I think she was suddenly confronted with the industry that she was supposed to, to, to regulate. And certainly that has been a massive, you know, shift in terms of, so the show's not being like boat shows or car shows or things like that anymore, but a lot more comfortable for women to be around as a consequence. Yes. We have a lot of questions, so we need to make the answers even shorter and quicker. Yeah. Sashi, why did you choose the agree side? Um, there is a development in the industry that women and female will be more involved and we have strong, but the facts are that it's harder for them. The industry is aggressive, it's male, we see it in the commercial discussions, and I think the industry needs to be a little bit more soft, and the uh, women can take it uh, to the next level. Right now, the facts are that uh, it's not there yet. Mm. It was interesting that you mentioned the 40-60 split here, because some data on this, then HR Connect, which is run by Heidi Loftus, it's a fantastic brand within the iGaming Next group. Uh, it's, a, it's a network for HR professionals within our industry. And among other things, they provide data and conduct surveys to help decision makers. And in a survey done just last week, so this is very fresh, one of the questions was how the gender percentage split looked in their organization. And looking at the largest cohorts, almost 80% said they had just a 40-60 split uh, with more men, and 15% said they had a 30-70% split, more men. So, why do you think there is less women in our industry? Um, again, I, I would agree with many of the panelists here. I think uh, I, I'd leave one, one comment, and that is that right now, as the industry is changing, and it is changing, um, that uh, there's a huge opportunity out there. Um, and there's a lot of uh, leadership opportunities for many ladies, maybe in the audience, uh, maybe watching this online after, after the actual sessions have finished. Um, and there's a great opportunity there. There's a lot of companies now that are really looking to position female leaders, not only in the C-suite, but also in board level. Uh, so take the opportunity. That's my message. Agreed. A follow-up question in the just mentioned survey also touches about what you said just now. Um, it asked how the split looked five years ago. Then the majority, 80%, answered that they had either a 20-80 split or a 30-70 split with more men. So there has been a huge movement in these five years. Why do you think that is, Hilary? Um, I think it's, as you were talking about earlier on, it's been an immature industry, a quite brash industry. I mean, there are so many chords at the moment that I see with crypto in terms of it being like the early days of the online gaming world, you know, saying, again, male-dominated rather than... Uh, female dominated, you know, um, as I said, the same sort of brash outlook in terms of regulation, etc. I think it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's not about being politically correct. I think it's just across the board, people have realized that women can add real value at an executive level and they can be as good managers of people as, as, as men can. It's just about being given the, given the opportunity. And, you know, and also not to want to be patronized. I don't want to board position because I'm a woman. I want to do it because I feel I'm capable of doing it. And thank goodness I have a UBO that, that has faith in me to do it as well. I'm glad to hear. Last question on the topic. Uh, Alex, how do you think we can attract more women? Uh, I, yeah, that is the problem. I don't think the industry attracts enough. I mean, when we, when we look for sea levels, uh, we don't get in many applications for women, from women. And uh, uh, that's the problem, I think. Yeah. 
Any ideas on how we could do? Anybody? I think it starts early on. I mean, uh, when we grow up, uh, what do we play with? How do we engage with our mothers and fathers? Mm. Uh, I, I have a daughter, uh, and, and I try to involve her in everything I do. So, you know, I love to play computer games, and me and her spend hours playing games nowadays. So, uh, I think it starts there. Good answer to round off this topic, I think. So, let's move on to the next topic. And, uh, Yes. Employees working from home or in a hybrid home office model is as efficient as having everyone in the office full time. Panelists, please your choice. George, do you agree or disagree? Is it as efficient? So I'm just staying put in order to save my legs. <laughs> well, you are climbing Kilimanjaro, aren't you? So you better save all your energy. <laughs> I, I would like to sit there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Jasper, why did you choose the disagree side here? I think there are parts of um, organizations that do work as well or even better from home, actually. We see that <clears throat> when it comes to output. Maybe technology, to some extent, uh, it has that. When we look at a hybrid model, but for bigger teams like customer service and so forth, where we measure everything that is being done in, in quite an efficient way in regards to how my, many chats do you do, calls, and what's the satisfaction score mm. and so forth, there we see that it's better in the office than mm. at home. So it's a little bit uh, divided, but on the totality, I think in the, in the hybrid world, you also need to have hybrid at certain roles, yeah. Always in the office. But you, so have different rules. Do it. you have different rules for the different teams. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, that's the way we have chosen to approach it, at least. Thank you. You're very lonely on this side, David. So <laughs> why, why did you choose the agree side? Um, I, I'll, I'll put CS to one side. I think I might be in agreement with you there, actually, Jesper. But, uh, you know, when I, I took the question literally, um, and it focused on efficiency. Um, certainly, the experience that we've had is that our, our team members are uh, being exactly that. They're being very efficient with their time. It saves a lot of time in terms of uh, commuting, which is good for the team member. Um, most people within the organization are using that time not only for family time, but, but also for actually completing more. Um, and actually, the, the amount of time that one can focus uh, at home, and this is where the hybrid really comes into its own, I think, um, it really enables people to be able to get work done uh, without any particular distractions that you would have in the office. Um, that said, I don't think that 100% uh, at home is the right model. Um, I think that the hybrid approach is uh, by far one of the best because you need that interaction, you need the ability to be able to build those relationships between mm. all the different team members within the company and also to help you know, foster the culture that you want within the organization. Thank you. Saki, do you think you can be competitive as an employer if you don't have a hybrid or office working from home model today? So if we will not have an mm. hybrid office, yeah, it's, uh, it's impossible. The train left the station yeah. and we just need to see how to do it better. Um, and we see today, if I'm taking it from the efficiency of the employee to the efficiency of the company, of the department, I think that uh, we are not as efficient as before. It's more called technical tasks instead of engagement and to see how to do it even better. So we are checking the boxes, but not seeing how we can do it overall different, better, or to uh, take it to a different uh, direction. So it makes the company also with uh, delivers, you know, less commitment to the company because they don't see their manager in their eyes. So it's easy for them to live. Mm. So you have more employees, you need to train them more. So you're in a cycle that makes the company to be a little bit less efficient, in my opinion. I think, um, I think training is critical. I mean, there are certain jobs that you simply can't learn to do remotely. I mean, certainly the legal profession has suffered hugely as a result of even creating a hybrid model. So what we're trying to do at the moment in terms of new recruits, depending on the task and depending on the maturity of the person, their experience, is to insist that they do come in for a period. So say for the six, first six months of their contract, they're in the office. And then we can talk about, you know, being more relaxed once we feel confident that they are up to the task. But also for me, you know, David, you mentioned culture, absolutely critical for assimilation. 
And also, one that I was slightly concerned about certainly was, you know, the exploitation of actually people working at home full time. Because if you, you know, sent that Zoom invite, you expected to see someone at their desk immediately, and it was actually a harsher regime than when someone's in the office and wanders out at lunchtime or has a cup of coffee. But because they're actually there and being seen, they're, you know, they're deemed to be on. Whereas you were just expected to pick up your phone, get on, you know. Thousands and multiple calls all the time. So actually, it burnt it burnt people out as well, which wasn't fair. Yeah, and what we're really uh, missing as well is the transfer of knowledge. You know, yes. when you're working in a team exactly. and, Training. and you can learn from each other. And if exactly. you you know, the, usually the people that are best in the office, they usually work the best at home. Uh, but the problem there is that you lose that person to transfer knowledge to the team, uh, the other team members. And, and that's, that's a big problem. So some sort of consensus here on that side, but as Sashi said, that the train has left, so we have to adapt. It's time for a more spicy statement, and this one is interesting, so let's put it on the screen. Providers who offer services to operators with black or dark grey revenues are part of a larger problem. Panelists, please, your choice. choice. Do you agree or disagree? I get to me. <laughs> Why did you choose the agree side here? I mean, I mean re reality is as a, a B2C operator, uh, we have to take all the fights. Uh, you know, the, uh, reg regulators are bringing up that there is, there is a, a, a gambling problem and we need to attack it and we go on to the, the people that are, the, the, the companies that are regulated and trying to obey the rules. And the real problem is, is outside of, of the regulation. And if you have a, a B2B company taking the customers that is disappearing from the regulated market, that's just increasing the problem. And we have studies in Sweden where 90% of the people saying they have a problem, they play outside the regulation. Yeah. We're running out of time, but I want to hear one from this side as well. Just what I, you say. I think uh, that is a severe regulatory problem. I, I agree to that, but I think what, what we see today is that the B2B suppliers, they follow the rules that are in place for them to follow. And uh, I, I think, fair enough, you know, uh, they, they do that. I think over time that is likely to change, and some regulators are already changing that. I think the Dutch regulator, for example, have put in different requirements than others into the whole chain. but. Uh, it's a regulatory problem, and I would not. Uh, I understand the B2B suppliers that are acting in the way they do today because, quite frankly, they can do it. It's not illegal to do it, and they make a lot of money of doing that. Yeah. But it had been much better if we start self regulate. So we take the responsibility ourselves and do what's yeah. right. But it's not going to happen. <laughs> That's the, uh, if we don't do it, we're going to end up in the same situation that we are in at, at, yeah. as a B2C operator. But I, I mean, think the regulators years, will, re will regulate B2B yeah. as well. But I think in a few years, we're going to see fines coming out at B2B yeah. operation yeah. instead of B2C. I, I think so too. I agree. I would like to hear from Sashi mm -hmm. first on this one as a follow-up question. You have some insight. Do you believe providers of platforms and games are fully aware of in what countries their products are generating revenues? I can have a long answer of why yes, but the answer is clearly yes. And any provider that say differently, not saying the truth. David, you agree with this? Yeah. Good. Then we move to the next statement, please. Nice and simple. <laughs> yeah. The industry is doing enough to prevent gambling-related harm. Do you agree or do you disagree? Please take your seats. Working in the regulated market, I do feel that I take a lot of responsibility. But I understand why they sit there, because they were sitting there on the previous question. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so you know they have to take a stance then? Well, uh, that is the problem. The previous question is the problem till that we have this problem with, with, with uh, the responsible game, gaming, because hmm. they do not take enough responsibility. Hmm. Hilary, what are you saying? Yes, I mean, it's taken decades for the industry to wake up and realise that they needed to do more. I'm not setting the bar at the extreme that the UK Gambling Commission has, because I think it's the pendulum swung too far the other way, but people were very, very slow 
to it's realize what they needed to do to, to prevent this problem coming down the line. Um, you know, not just obviously the ability to self-exclude, but all the deposit limits we were talking about yesterday, etc. So um, the industry could still do more. And they're only doing it in the markets where they're being forced to do it at the moment, like the UK. That's the problem. Whereas it should be across the board from an ethical perspective. But if, if the question is, if a friend of mine took our talent, this that is was, the question? They put the wrong question up there, uh -huh. sorry. Yeah. Okay. Technology. We're, so, st we're still with the, uh, if we're doing enough to prevent gambling-related harm. I can do a follow-up question to, to you, Tashi. Kindred, as an example, they have the great ambition that I will walk none... I because I agree. <laughs> Kindred has the great ambition that uh, none of their revenues will be derived from harmful gambling by the end of 2023. Do you believe it's doable for them or for any other operator? Of course. After Netherlands was shut, it's easier. So uh, they will meet it. Nothing left, almost. So, yeah, it will be 100% uh, legal. Yeah. And I, I, I fundamentally disagree with this because it's to, it may be you know, nice to have a, a vision that is not achievable. It's also in the same way if we were Heineken and were to say no one would ever become an alcoholic on Heineken. Yeah. I don't think that's possible. I, I don't find that to be truthful. So I think more can be done in many ways, but... All research has shown for consistently over the years that there are about 2% of the population in most countries that are having a gambling problem. And they, it seems hard to get, get away from that. And I think for, for any operator that stands out in that way, they, it would be very difficult to, to, to deliver on, on that message. That said, you should still do what is the right thing for the customers and try to prevent it but I don't think it's possible to achieve it to that sense. And also what happens then to the ones that can't be part of what you're doing? Mm. Where do they play if they don't stop to play? I think it's better that you know, they play in regulated operators that pay the tax and really try to do something good for it than being pushed out to the black market as they are being today by regulators in many cases. And, um, and that's not, a good, uh, that's not a good trend for the players or for the operators who are following the rules. True. David, do you think a big reason for operators to get, for example, a Curaçao license that they spoke about here earlier in the panels is to avoid the RG measures? I wouldn't say it's to avoid RG measures. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons that most operators would probably do that is, is to avoid some of the, the regulatory measures that have been put in place outside of RG. Uh, with the excuse of RG. Um, you know, there are certain jurisdictions that have put in regulatory measures which just don't make sense, quite frankly, from an iGaming perspective. No. Uh, there's other ways in which one can uh, support the business, support the industry, and support the player uh, than putting in hard and fast rules across certain types of gameplay, for example. True. Um, and I think that's the challenge. Uh, it fundamentally creates a a poor player experience in some of the territories where the regulators just not really understood the problem. True. We only have time for one more, so let this one remain and let it be our last statement, the ones that's on here. I have been upset by a friend in the industry poaching one of my or our top talents. Do you agree or do you disagree? <laughs> it's a humble bunch. <laughs> Jasper, why did you disagree here? No, I, I, I have not been as <coughs> upset with that. If someone is being poached and want to leave, I, li live your life. <laughs> if, if I may, I think, I think it's, uh, it's one of the things that's really, really interesting about this industry and really attracts a lot of people to stay within the industry, and that is we're such tight-knit. Um, I think if there ever was a situation whereby... Um, an, empl an employee was being recruited by either a competitor or somebody else, There's, there may generally be a conversation at sea level and say, look, this is happening, I want you to be aware, we're not actually going to stop the process, yeah. but I, I wanted to give you a heads up. Um, and I think within the industry that shows a, a certain sign of respect as well, um, that, you know, which, which I wish would uh, permeate across many other parts of what we do as an industry. So you shouldn't even make a call. I'm, I'm, I'm taking your CMO, you and I are friends. I shouldn't call you and say, hey, it's like... I'd appreciate the call. That way I'm never upset. No. Disagree. 
<laughs> True. I think it's uh, two aspects. One, if it's a friend taking, I totally agree. It's fine. You can take it. This is the nature of things. Mm. But if it's something that was a friend within the company, working inside, went out and took a bunch of employees, this is something that makes me upset. Perfect. Mm -hmm. We're out of time. Please help me in giving them all a warm applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.